Hi, everyone. I'm trying to win the award for the most awkward talk title yet, embedding Flink throughout an operationalized streaming ML lifecycle. Um, maybe I'll add uh, at scale with big data later, just to make it really long. Uh, I'm Dave Turok, my colleague Samir Watkar, and we're from Comcast. Uh, we're aligned with the customer experience team. We're trying to make customer experience our best product. Uh, Comcast has about 27 million customers across a few product lines. We do high-speed data, home internet, uh, video, both streaming and cable, uh, voice, home security, and uh, we just launched Xfinity Mobile. Our team uh, ingests about 2 billion events per month, which to me sounds like small big data. It comes out to about 1,000 events per second uh, sustained. Uh, we tend to concentrate on customer interaction points, so there isn't that much that's machine telemetry generated. These are things like a customer calls in for uh, a question, uh, an, a, a uh, technician is scheduled to visit, they might run a speed test, uh, pay their bill. All of these human-generated events come in. We started out a couple years ago with about 15 streams of data and we've grown to about 150 different real-time and batch streams of data in, in, in just about a year. And the way we did that is we built a self-service portal for data sources to onboard their own data. And so the, the data is getting bigger and bigger. We have access to some larger machine telemetry data. And our architecture for this platform is very, very standard. We read from Kafka, Kinesis, go through typical ETL, landed in a time series data lake, and we have uh, APIs and some visualizing applications to look at this uh, historical data. And I just want to mention Comcast collects, stores, and uses all data in accordance with privacy and laws and disclosures. So what's the business problem? We're trying to increase our positive customer experiences. We want to take any potential issues and diagnose them, solve them as soon as possible. And with things like sending a technician to a home, that tends to be very expensive. The earlier we can detect problems and avoid uh, visits that aren't necessary, we can save money for ourselves and our customers. From a technical perspective, we have multiple programming and data science environments. Uh, data scientists like to use R, Spark, Python, you name it. Uh, we have a lot of JVM-based operationalized uh, streaming platforms, uh, and uh, getting the two to talk is uh, sometimes a problem. Uh, the number of data sources we have is incredible. We've managed to have a large-scale Kafka and Kinesis set of pipelines to try to bring this together, but still, as with any large organization, there are islands of data, there's huge things sitting in batch in legacy warehouses, Oracle, you name it. Uh, and for a streaming platform, uh, what I call the data plane problem, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, is, is really hard. How do you combine all the data that's at rest with all your streaming data in motion? From a machine learning perspective, historically, uh, data scientists have found data somewhere, created some models, decided to tweak some parameters, and at some point send it over to engineers and say, here, here's our model, put this into production. And, and the people who are operationalizing it are saying, wait, what? where's the data coming from? How do I create the features that you need? Uh, and so we're trying to solve the problem of bringing the data scientists and, and the operationalizing together. Now, I, I know that uh, some of you may be experienced in machine learning, some may not, but a feature, uh, just to reiterate, is any piece of data that's an input to a prediction model, it could be something as simple as the customer's current billing amount, it could be something that's uh, stateful or accumulated, like the number of service calls that a customer's had over the last 90 days. And I believe we use the word feature in this presentation about 487 times, uh, so you'll see that again. So what were we trying to do with our solution? We wanted to, first of all, have a self-service platform. We had great success in onboarding data producers and having them come to a portal and basically onboard their own uh, sources with an ETL-like tool. But can we do that for machine learning and for data scientists? We want to treat models as code. The, the problem of having uh, models and, and features and data that are kind of done ad hoc and then somehow translate into production code is where we really want to uh, bridge that gap. Aligning the data scientists and the production, and lastly, and the reason why we're here at Flint Conference is we want to have a high throughput stream platform. Today we're doing about 2 billion events per month, which as I said is small big data, but probably within the next month or two we'll have an order of magnitude larger coming into our platform. So the machine learning life cycle is very much like a, a software development life cycle. First you have a use case, 
data scientists may take a look and do some feature exploration and say, what are the different pieces of derived and other data that I can find that might influence my ability to predict a good outcome? Uh, do training, you iteratively look at, uh, does this work, does it validate? You saw earlier pictures of ROC curves. And at some point you say, this is a pretty good model, let's try it in a live in the dark setting and see if it's actually predicting what we want it to predict. If it looks good, if you try different ones and you pick the one that is actually uh, producing the best results, you might operationalize that and put that into production. But data goes stale, models go stale, and within a week or two, depending on, uh, it could be the weather, it could be the way people are reacting to the system, you need to retrain the model on newer data. So there is an iteration here of taking a look at your results and bringing it back into your data pipeline again. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes your results may be 30 days after you put the model in. If, if we say that we've fixed a customer's problem, how do we know that it's actually fixed? We might wait 30 days and make sure there are no calls in or no more truck rolls. So here's an example of one of our use cases that we're putting in production. A uh, customer at home and then say, hmm, something's not quite right maybe, I'll run a speed test. Go to speedtestinfinity.com, uh, run a speed test. That generates an event, it comes through our Kafka platform or Kinesis platform into uh, our streaming platform and we say, hmm, this looks like it might be not up to what the customer is provisioned for. Maybe they are getting 55 megabits per second and the provision for 175. We would then go out and, and enrich this with some of the network data. Let's see what the network looks like. Let's see what the customer's uh, modem looks like and see if those are uh, up to snuff. If everything checks out okay, or we get those data points, we run it through the prediction model, and we're trying to determine, is the problem likely with perhaps Wi-Fi? Is it in the modem, or is it in the network? Let's say it's a problem with Wi-Fi. We may then engage the customer and, and send them a note saying, hey, you know, we noticed you ran your uh, four-year-old Android tablet on your Wi-Fi, and you weren't getting the speeds you were getting. You might want to get a new device. You might want to move closer to the gateway. Uh, if it's a different kind of problem, we may uh, ask the customer to schedule a technician visit if it's something that can't be resolved by something we suggest to the customer. So when we were coming up with our new pipeline and our architecture, we wanted a few principles that we wanted to uh, keep in place. Uh, one is metadata and uh, making sure that we don't have to write it as much code as we were doing previously. The more we can be metadata driven, uh, we can define things on the fly, we can put things into production without having to do a code deployment in some cases. Uh, where we do have to put things in deployment, we want to use automation. And then for model iterations, as a data scientist, a lot of times you're uh, basically checking a model, tweaking some parameters, checking it again, and we wanted to keep the data consistent and the model iteration consistent so that we know what versions of the data and the model are being used at any given time so that when we put it into production, we can correlate that. Since we were uh, successful with a portal uh, for self-service, we want to have rapid onboarding for model use cases and for the models themselves. And one of the big uh, themes that you've heard throughout the day is data consistency when doing feature generation. We want to make sure that the data that the data scientists are using is the same data that's being used in production for live prediction. And lastly, monitoring metrics. When we're running this, we want to see how the model's performing. We want to see the, not only the predictions, but also throughput and uh, you know, what rate of uh, predictions are going to which uh, bucket. The last overlay that we have for our pipeline is the different roles that we have. So we've identified three roles that are using this pipeline. One is the business user who is uh, picking the use cases and saying this is what I want to uh, create a model for, and they would also help select the model and um, also validate some of the results. The data scientist is primarily involved in engineering the features and reviewing validation results and, and the uh, training in the first place, and, and operationalizing uh, things for putting into the production and also creating the feature pipelines. At least in the beginning, we're currently manually creating the features. Uh, I'll get to it later when we're hoping to automate some of that as well. So I knew I'd get to Flink after a few slides. Why Apache Flink? Our team has been using Flink for about a year and a half. Uh, we've been using it primarily for some ETL and orchestration flows. Uh, but, but really, from the beginning, uh, with the first class streaming model, with the statefulness and, and having a local state with uh, RocksDB is something that, uh, at least at the time, two years ago when I first looked at it, none of the other competing products really had. So that's what drew me to, drew me to Flink uh, a couple years ago. 
the stateful semantics and the windowing, uh, since we're dealing with real-time events, we use the uh, event time quite uh, heavily in, in creating our tumbling windows. And uh, it's open source, and the community's been growing. Uh, this is the second year we were not here last year um, at Flink Forward in San Francisco, but uh, we expect to be here going forward. All right. So I did want to just talk about the data plane problem for a minute, which is, and, and not just for machine learning, but even when you're doing complex event processing of any kind, you can't always just rely on the data coming in from your stream as having all the information you need to make any kind of decision. Uh, there's at least four or five sources where you'd like to assemble to be able to say, ah, now I have all the features and information that I need. Besides the kind of streaming that you can get with window operations and map operations and Flink, you might want to call an enterprise service to get an up-to-date, real-time view of a particular piece of data, like a, a, a customer's current bill amount at this very moment may be very important. Some uh, larger data sets you might have stored in S3 or HDFS with some uh, file abstraction. And lastly, you might need to query a historical database to get things like number of uh, uh, times something's called in in the last 30 days. Uh, one thing I've struggled with, which uh, I've heard some of the other uh, talks kind of uh, address, is what's the longest period that you really want to have in Flink state? Can you deal with a seven day rolling or a 15 day rolling? Uh, gentleman from Lyft uh, talked about back, uh, not backfilling, but uh, bootstrapping state from a historical store, and that's a very interesting approach as well. Uh, but we haven't looked at that yet, but, uh, but certainly getting things like what happened in the last 30 days is part of our uh, model execution. And with that, I've described problems enough. I'm going to turn this over to Samir to talk about some of the solutions that we did. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, so as Dave mentioned, uh, we have developed a framework which lets uh, data scientists and MLOps teams to create and deploy models consistently. Uh, we also have a feature store which where we collect and utilize features used by models consistently. So this is how the ML model execution works. Uh, firstly, we get like a model execution request trigger, which is a payload which only contains information like uh, which model name to execute and very basic information like account number or possibly device ID. The next slide I'll tell you how, how exactly that request originates. But that's all we get. So we have a model name, we have an account number. So obviously that's not enough to execute any model. We need a lot more features to execute a model. So what we have is a metadata layer, which informs us as to, for a given model, what are the features that are needed? And then we have an online feature store, which contains features, the current values of the features, by account number or by account number and device ID. So, so when we get the account number and the model name, the next thing we do is that we inquire the model metadata layer, like what are the features do I need? And then we go to the online feature store in the feature assembly step, extract the most current values of the features, and then hand it over to model execution with a fully assembled set of features to make the prediction and then push the prediction out to another stream. So this is how the uh, model execution request triggers. Uh, the model execution request can happen through a requesting application. This could be a customer speaking in their virtual assistant on a mobile device. They could make us utterance like, uh, I'm having a slow internet or I'm having internet problems. So then the NLP engine kicks in, uses that utterance to create like a specific set of intents like bad internet or intermittent internet. And then they have a decision engine layer which looks at these intents for a customer and makes a decision as to whether a model needs to run. So let's assume that uh, it makes a decision to invoke a model which we call as a necessary truck rule model. So the, we want to find an answer to the question, is a truck rule necessary to fix the customer problems? So that invokes the REST service, which basically sends that model name and the account number to a, to a queue, which could be a Kafka topic or a Kinesis queue. Alternatively, what we have is that we could have instruments, we could have devices which are instrumented to send the health data over to various streams. And we could listen to these events. Uh, we could also listen to events like a uh, customer runs a speed test and what are the values of the speed test. And that trigger event listener could basically have a rule which says that if the download speed is less than 25% of the advertised speed, well, they go run the necessary truck roll model. So there are two multiple ways in which the model can be invoked. But essentially, it's an asynchronous invocation which says, this is the model and this is the account number. Go execute the model. So this is an extension of that. So this is the happy path. So what happens is that we get a model execution request. Uh, that box in the middle which says, are all the features current? Let's assume that all the features are current. We have all the features necessary to execute the model in the online feature store. We get that, we invoke the model execution, and then we write the model execution prediction to the prediction sync. 
and the prediction sync will eventually write it to our customer context, which is listening to the model prediction because we tie it up by a request ID. So when the initial request comes, there is a request ID. When the, the response goes out, there's a, there's a request ID attached to it. And when the customer context is updated, the decision engine layer again takes that result and makes a decision. So let's say we decided that the truck role is necessary. Then the customer context would basically transfer the user to another workflow. Like, let's say, like, let me get you in touch with an agent. Uh, let's, uh, let's get uh, a truck role scheduled through an application. Alter and the prediction also is written down to a prediction sync. So what we have as a goal is that we collect the predictions and eventually we collect the outcomes and the goal is to match the predictions to the outcomes, create newer data sets to refine the model with new data and also to track how well the model is doing. This is the exception path. Now there are some features that may not be current. Now there are different types of features, like there are some kind of features like, you know, how many times has a customer called in the last 30 days? Or for a given device, how many errors have you seen in the last 24 hours? So those kind of features are always current because we're constantly evaluating them. But there are other features that are very expensive to obtain, like one of the examples of such a feature is called as a PHT, which is, goes for premise health test. So what this feature is, we have to request it on demand. So if a model needs this kind of feature, and the feature does not exist in the online feature store, we have to call a service. Uh, we use the Flink async operator to do that, an external service. That external service will query all the devices for a given account number, collect the metrics and the health data for it, write it to the online feature store, and then kick off the happy path again. So there are features that may exist in the online feature store, which may or may not be current, and the model metadata is what drives that. So let's say you have a model A and model B. And model A says that I need PHT data, but my tolerance for stale data is 72 hours. A model B could say that my tolerance to PHT data is only 24 hours. So while the model is executing, when the, when the features are obtained from the online feature store, the decision is made based on the model whether the feature is current or not. If the feature is not current for a, from the point of view of a given model, then the whole model feature creation pipeline kicks in, gets the features from an external source, and then writes it to the online feature store. There's also the history feature store. So, so what happens in the online feature store is that every time we get a new feature, we overwrite it because it's only the current values. It's supposed to be interactive because it can happen in a streaming sense. The history feature store is what we use S3 for, S3 buckets for, and we get these features and we write them to the history feature store and, and we partition them in a very hive-like manner. So when we get the feature metadata, feature data, it could have things like uh, the updated timestamp. And we have metadata, which is basically a bunch of Python scripts, Jython, which are executed through Jython. We create these partitions and we write them to S3, and, and that's the store that is used by the data scientists when they train their models. So this is the Flink, Flink uh, point of view. So we get the model execution request. We don't specifically request the metadata. The metadata is always being pushed. We use connected streams to do that. Uh, we may discover that some of the features are not current, so we use side outputs to make feature requests. Eventually, we, we use a global window to tie down the model execution request to all the features using, uh, using request ID as a, as a key by clause. So that's, that's where the global windows come in. We have one pane for request ID. We have a custom trigger that is constantly listening to the global window pane. So every time a feature arrives, so let's say your model requires 50 features and, and 40 are current, so 10 more are coming. So each time a feature arrives, it, it triggers an element. So basically, we don't have to wait for a certain period of time. Every time a feature comes in, we make a decision whether the, the, the model needs to execute. The apply function is where the, the decision is made whether the model needs to execute or you just return without really doing anything. Now, what can happen in certain cases is that a feature may not arrive. Like in some cases, let's say that PHT service is down and we never get that feature. So we don't want the memory to be held up in the global window, so we want to expire it eventually. So every model declares in its metadata that its tolerance, uh, like it'll wait 60 seconds or maybe a minute before it finally expires. So what happens is uh, we have another trigger, the same custom trigger, also executes on event time. We use ingestion time as a characteristic, time characteristic. So every one minute or every two minutes, it basically triggers off, and then the apply function is called regardless. So even if the features don't arrive, the trigger will make sure that the apply function is called periodically. And in that apply function, the decision is made whether the model is ready to execute or the model has basically expired. You cannot, ex because it's been too long and let's evict it. And the custom evictor at the end of it would basically make a decision if the model is executed, it'll evict that pane. If the model is expired, then it'll evict the pane. This is more details on the uh, feature store. So we have an online feature store and we have a history feature store, as I mentioned. 
We have feature creation pipelines which override the online feature store and append to the uh, history feature store. The only thing we as a framework team owns is the metadata layer. Uh, but we, we do understand that within the company, different teams may have a different requirements for the online feature store. So we let the feature metadata indicate to us that where its features are actually going to be stored. So we support multiple types of online feature stores. We support PostgreSQL. We use AWS RDS and Aurora DB for very low volume on-demand features. So this is where the async operator of Flink comes in. We make external request calls to get the features. We also use HPACE and DynamoDB for high volume feature ingest. So this is a case when we get a lot of features because like we discussed earlier, we got like 27 million customers. Devices are sending data to us. So some, some features uh, we cannot store in Postgres. We store them in HPACE or DynamoDB. And we're looking at Flink variable state for, for really high volume ingest and high vol velocity model execution requests. So these are cases wherein uh, the devices are sending the health data and we want to basically proactively monitor for health problems. So even before the customer recognizes they have a problem, we fix it proactively. So those are the situations where we're looking at Flink variable state. So we have feature creation pipelines. Uh, we, we divide them into two categories. Uh, we have aggregation features. An example of an aggregation feature is how many times has a customer called in the last 30 days or per device, like what are the signal errors per device in the last 24 hour tumbling windows. We have on-demand features, which make an external REST API call to get it. They essentially push to the feature, feature store. This is an example of a streaming example. Detect accounts with signal errors with crown greater than 2,000 in the last 24 hours. We use, uh, those are the Flink features that we used. Uh, value states, sliding windows, filter functions. I already spoke about this. Uh, we have um, PHT as one of the examples. Uh, one of the things I want to mention here is that we do a lot of feature engineering through our metadata. Because some of our features, like this PHT object that I mentioned, is a huge object, is a huge JSON object, which contains a lot of sub-features. Not all models need the entire content of the PHT object. So what we do is that we let let the model model metadata define the feature engineering. We have we use things like JSON path, we use Jython scripts, uh, and we all call them at runtime when we actually execute the model to extract features out sub-features out of the larger feature objects. And lastly, we have the ML prediction components. So currently, the type of models we have in production are H2OAI POJO objects. Uh, we have plain regression models, which are nothing but a few weights that are applied on, on features. And these are just Python scripts, which can be executed via a Java runtime using Jython. Uh, we also have external models running as a Python REST service in our Docker container, which have to be invoked using the async operators. And we also have models which uh, which execute using um, on specialized machines using GPU support. These are also TensorFlow models. So we support multiple deployment uh, deployment methods. We support uh, the REST API. We support the Flink map operators for large scaling. We always support the REST API because it's easy to test things out. So if uh, because every time a model execution request comes in, and we decide that these are the features we want to uh, these are the features we assembled, and this is the prediction we made. We log all that information. So in case we get an error, we can just use the REST API to quickly test things out. So with this, I'm going to hand over back to Dave to walk you through the rest of the presentation. Yeah, thanks. OK, so one, one of the things that we really wanted to tie together is making sure, like I said, that everything from the model metadata to the feature metadata to the code pipelines that generate our features to the actual code that's running in the uh, uh, feature uh, I'm sorry, the ML prediction is all versioned. We version everything. That way we can tie everything together. Things are stored in GitHub, and we can uh, make sure that we can trace from the model to the data to the prediction and and have auditability. If we want to replay the, the version data that we've stored in the historical feature store and regenerate it with the, the same model, different model, we can do that. And by doing this repeatability, we can ensure that what we put into production is what we tried out in, uh, in feature engineering in the first place. The, uh, the CICD support that we're doing right now, uh, we're not fully in our automated sense. We have uh, you know, Mortar, Jenkins, uh, a couple of our teams are using Go CD, but at some point we want a real full lifecycle automation uh, in place. We have a lot of deployment scripts right now, we're getting there. And our team tends to be uh, on AWS, but we have requirements to also be able to deploy into the uh, Comcast private cloud. So we've engineered our solution to be as AWS agnostic as possible. Uh, we're using both Flink, I'm sorry, uh, Kinesis connectors as well as Kafka connectors. And uh, where we can, we're making it pluggable so that we can 
decide at deployment time which environment we're going to. If anything, we're making it a little bit too pluggable. We want to make sure that we can put in any piece of code uh, to be feature engineering and uh, I'm sorry, feature generation. So the same piece of Python snippet that a data scientist put in their uh, Python uh, Spark pipeline when they were making the model, the same piece of Python code is what's stored in GitHub and then run within the uh, Jython environment in our Flink pipeline. To this extent, we're moving the needle towards the pluggable and not using quite as many of the native Flink operators as we probably would like to. So at some point, we're going to take a look at where we can do more generation of the, the Flink native features and a little bit less pluggability. Um, on the other hand, um, it gives us a lot of flexibility for deployment and for tying together the data scientist workflows and the operational uh, code running the exact same code. Uh, as far as multi-deployment options, as Samir said, almost every place where we can either call a REST service, we're also envisioning that we can run something within Flink native with a map operator. We've done that with h2o.ai because they generate POJOs. In many cases, that's not going to be the case. There may be an external service that we just have to call for a certain kind of uh, model execution framework. We are not dictating to the data scientists too much yet on which kind of modeling environments, which kind of execution environments they can use. Uh, I've seen a couple of talks, uh, I think last year, I, in, I believe it was ING, talked about using PMML as the sort of model in the middle to tie together everything. We'd rather do a mapping of here is a selection of uh, data scientist tools you can use to generate your model, and these are the execution environments that support each of those. So where are we going from here? As I mentioned, we really would like to look at generating some of the Flink native feature engineering flows. Uh, we're looking at the Uber Athena X project. Uh, I really like the SQL on stream and the native support there, and just a similar approach of using, hopefully not a homegrown DSL, but something that's uh, standard to be able to generate our features. The UI portal for self-service is something that we've mocked up, but we haven't yet built. Um, but since we've built a couple of self-service portals for the data ingestion pipelines, I think we'll be able to do this to have a dashboard of what are the use cases, which are the models that support that use case, and really seeing the status of each of these models and tests and where they are in the production pipeline. Uh, queryable state is something that we're really looking at for bringing the, uh, the data at rest closer to the Flink runtime. Uh, that's, that's really to help solve the uh, low latency problems as we scale up to not just 2 billion, but 20 billion, 40 billion events per month we'll have to rely a lot less on external talks and bring it back to, uh, external calls and bring it back into the, the Flink runtime and local state. Uh, the retraining process is something that right now is fully manual, saying, like I said, 30 days after problems, seeing and correlating those to uh, the predictions and seeing whether or not we predicted it was in a certain uh, problem area and was that true or not for a particular customer. And uh, also with the online feature store, the queryable state is one option, we're on, uh, Postgres is our, our initial one, and DynamoDB, so pluggable based on your SLA of what is the feature store that you want to do based on scale, based on speed. All right, so what have we learned? I mean, really the summary is that Flink has helped us achieve our business goals. Um, I believe in Flink. I've believed in it for two years ever since I started looking at it, even though I didn't touch it until about a year and a quarter ago or so. Between the, the windowing model, the continuous uh, uh, stream, uh, rather than batch orientedness. Uh, the asynchronous uh, calls, we're, uh, we're using the async IO that Alibaba uh, contributed about a year ago, as well as just the nature of having Kafka and Kinesis syncs in uh, sources. Uh, so we've separated parts of our flow to be uh, tied in by queues so we can operate them independently. Uh, and connected streams helps us use the metadata approach to change our models and change our things in runtime without having to deploy new code. So you have one stream for your uh, data and another stream for your metadata, and you can very easily uh, manipulate your pipeline at that point. And we think that the queryable state will be a very good fit. I uh, saw the demo downstairs earlier of the SQL uh, CLI that they're putting in and, and looking at the uh, SQL uh, uh, REST uh, capability in future versions, which will be interesting as well. So that's our talk. Thank you, and we'll take questions now. Hi, could you talk a little bit about the uh, feature engineering process and feature creation process, meaning 
Like when you design a new feature and you want to add it to the feature store, do you only make it available for new data going forward, or do you reprocess historical data? Uh, you know, anything along those lines? Uh, we're still early in, in, in sort of putting that process in place. So far, we've been storing many of our uh, feeds in S3 just as they come in. So we have the raw data historically going back for some period of time. Uh, so when we have our team of scientists and they have access to that S3 and they're engineering their features, uh, that particular code, when we put it into production, it's mostly on new data. We haven't gone back in backfill and kind of like restored a historical um, set for, say, the last five months or two years of particular data streams. Uh, the, the other issue is that, um, as I said, our, our data stream library and catalog keeps on growing. So there may be certain features that use 10 streams that are available today, but if you look back two months, two of them were onboarded in the last two months. So, so we haven't yet uh, gotten to the point where we can say, uh, you know, yes, we have all this data for the past n years, and, and once you come up with a feature, we can then reprocess that and have that available, not just going forward, but historically. Yeah, and our, our core system has been in production for like what, about a month for the, this particular machine learning pipeline. And so some of, some of the processes right now we're just figuring out. And as we go forward, we'll have more of the automation and more of like what the different roles do. Hi, may I know the latency of uh, your end-to-end -end system uh, from the time uh, the user's device sends a message to the Kinesis queue and then you process the whole thing and then you send the prediction back to the user? Um, I didn't hear everything. You, you wanted to know the latency end-to-end -end of what, feed, uh, stream coming in through going through assembly and then to the prediction? Yeah. So for the three models that we have now, um, uh, for the ones that don't use that, what I call the expense, or Samir called the expensive premise health test, which takes about 30 or 60 seconds to run, we're getting less than 10 seconds mm -hmm. for end to end. Yeah, I mean, we don't have very complex models yet with hundreds of features. Uh, most of them are taking maybe 10 features. And what about the latency of the HTTP, or the, the REST API calls that you are making, and also the calls to your feature store, the online feature store? Right, so the online feature store is actually PostgreSQL, and so it's been very quick. We're, we're using it in Aurora AWS, so it's on the order of probably 30 to 50 milliseconds. Um, however, we did recently decide that, um, like, we had, we had one uh, flow that wanted to get about 20 uh, individual features, um, and we thought making 20 calls uh, was a little bit too expensive, so we turned that into a batch to get, or a single REST call to then do one quick uh, get from uh, our database to return that all in one batch. So there are some cases where we found uh, you know, doing, doing that wide uh, spread of calls was still too inefficient. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I assume TensorFlow is connected to the GPUs? Ten, uh, TensorFlow is connected with GPUs? Is is that the question? Well, that's, uh, those models run as in their own containers, and they are exposed as a REST endpoint, and they are invoked through our, our framework. Okay. So are, are they accessing that online data store? They don't, they don't directly access the online feature store, so the exact process is that when the model needs to run, uh, the metadata informs us what features are needed. So we go get the online, uh, the framework goes and gets the features from the online feature store, and then hands it over to that REST endpoint to make the prediction. The models, per se, don't request the online feature store at all. It's the framework which delivers the feature to the model for execution. So there's no, um, there's no data movement? But the data movement is from the framework to the model execution endpoint with all the features ready, just go execute, give me the response back, and then we publish it to the prediction queue. Uh, could you say more about when you're not following the happy path. Like you mentioned, like sometimes with this PhD, there's uh, a lot of different features and, uh, and sometimes you're not even able to get them, but you get some of the data. And, and could you say more about how do you uh, decide, okay, we can execute it with less data and we're not as confident, but we're, what are sort of the bounds of finding like it's safe to execute even though we're not gonna get the best results here? 
So, so we have models which uh, which basically can execute with less data. So let's say a model needs 50 features to run and we give it null values for 25, it will give us a prediction. So, so at this point, we let the let that execution request expire and we publish the failure uh, failure out. But we are building in an additional exception workflow wherein we can say that even if you don't have the features within a certain time frame, go execute the model anyways. We just haven't implemented that yet. So currently we have the model metadata which says that uh, within 60 seconds or within it, de it defined in the metadata store within 120 seconds, you know, just uh, do not do not run the model but simply expire that request and publish the expiry result. But you're right. I mean, we're going to support the other features too that uh, let the model decide if it wants to execute with incomplete data. And how how vast is this? Like, how many models are you running per day or month or in? Let's see, right, right now we have three models in production. Um, one of them's running on a stream which is about 150 per second, but that's not a very complex model. Um, so we don't have this running on sort of our full breadth of, uh, it's, you know, thousands. sort of like second. you've been doing it for a couple of months and you're ramping yeah. it up and making Yeah, I mean, a couple of the, so, so we have the data science teams who have been uh, making these models and have been running on them on live streams for several months. And then this framework, which allows us to really version and assemble the features and have separable components to go get uh, the, the features and then call the prediction is what's new in the last month or so. So some of those models have been running and outputting uh, predictions into um, stores for probably about six months or so. Thank you. All right, um, I think we're also just about time. So Great. thank you, um, Dave and Samir. Thank you. And Great. Thank you. Thank you.